Father, we do ask your blessing. We ask, Lord, that by your word, the same word that authored creation, the same word that called life into existence, the same word by which Jesus was raised from the dead, Lord, we pray that the power of your word now would ring out in our lives, that as we hear your word and obey your word, that you would give us life, that you would refresh and strengthen our faith in Jesus Christ, that our hearts would be set upon him, set upon the steadfast faithfulness of Christ our Savior, that our hearts would be set upon your love, O God, that you have proven and shown once and for all by the sending of your Son to die in the place of sinners, to save those who believe in him. And Lord, we believe. Would you help our unbelief, help our disobedience, help our weakness? In our great need, Lord, would you provide? Would you provide grace in your sovereign fullness? Would you provide grace that is so rich and free that our hearts rise up in adoration and thanksgiving and vitality because of your ministry among us this morning? And we ask that you would do all this so that the name of Jesus is glorified in us, his church, here in Greater Victoria and around the world. And in his name we pray. Amen. So turn and look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 with me, and we'll read the first five verses. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and the first five verses. Finally, brothers... Pray for us, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. If you were standing with me for the reading of the scripture, you can please be seated. And uh, as I normally would say, now we'll take up the morning offering. But just to remind you, you can give to the ministry of Beacon Church by going to bcchurch.ca slash giving. The title of my message this morning is What It Takes to Live as a Christian. What It Takes to Live as a Christian. How is Ezra going to get a a caravan of priests and women and children from Babylon all the way to Jerusalem, 1,400 kilometers without protection? The journey would take many months, and there would be bandits, there would be raiders, there would be enemies along the way. But Ezra was stuck. He couldn't ask the king of Babylon for a military escort. Even though he had the king's favor, he couldn't ask him for help, because he had been boasting to the king. He had been boasting that the true God, the God of Israel, is a gracious God, is a God who watches over those who seek him, who watches over and is gracious to his people. Ezra 8.22 says, For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king The hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. That's why he didn't ask the king of Babylon for protection for his caravan to arrive safely in Jerusalem. And I wonder if Ezra Ezra ever thought to himself, if only I'd kept my big mouth shut about God. If only I hadn't gone on boasting about how powerful and how good and how gracious our God is to his people. If only I'd just been silent about my faith in God. Then now I could ask for the protection that I really need. I wonder if he ever thought something like that. The awkward truth about letting people know that you believe in God is that sometimes they expect you to live like it. For Ezra, 
God's reputation was on the line. He believed that God is the true God. But would he now show up? Would God be sovereign? And is God really gracious to those who seek him? So what did Ezra do? He did the most practical thing he could do. He gathered all his people together and held a week-long prayer meeting. And then after that, after the prayer was finished, then it says on the 12th day after leaving downtown Babylon, they, they got up and they set off without any armed escort all the way for Jerusalem. You know, back then the Middle East was a dangerous place. But four months later, they arrived in Jerusalem. Four months of travel, they arrived in Jerusalem. And Ezra wrote, The hand of our God was on us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and, and from ambushes along the way. Ezra 8.31 Christians today, Christians today don't seem to have as much faith, do they, in, in God showing up like Ezra did. Christians today don't seem to have as much confidence in God's miraculous provision like Ezra did, do we? We're more practical, aren't we? We like to hedge our bets just in case God doesn't answer our prayers. We like to have a backup plan, right? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul and those writing with him, they say, wrong. Christians are not just upheld by God now and then. Not just in moments of crisis. Not just in moments of panic, when nothing else will work. Prayer is not a last-ditch resort. Prayer is not a final straw that we grasp at. In verses 1 to 5 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul implies three truths that show that the whole Christian life, from conversion until resurrection, the whole Christian life is so utterly dependent on the sovereign grace of God that to be a Christian for even a single day means you must trust Jesus absolutely. To put that in, in other words, more simply, we learn here that the whole Christian life is so dependent on sovereign grace that to be a Christian for even one day, you must trust Christ absolutely. Paul begins here with asking for prayer in verse 1. And then maybe you noticed when I read those verses that uh, at the end in verse 5, he offers a prayer. So he begins by asking for a prayer. And at the end in verse 5, he gives a prayer. So before verse 5, before we get to that prayer that Paul gives, that Paul offers for the Thessalonians, let's look at three ways that Paul shows the whole Christian life is dependent on sovereign grace. And then when, when we get to verse 5, when we get to the prayer that Paul offers for the Thessalonians, then we'll see. Then we'll be able to get it. We'll be able to see that without what he prays for, nobody could make it even one day as a Christian. So first, let's look at verses, verses 1 and 2. And my first point is this. Without sovereign grace, you can't spread the gospel. Look with me at verses 1 and 2. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. It's, it's as if in this letter of 2 Thessalonians, that it reads like it was written uh, during brief interruptions in a prayer meeting. The whole letter is kind of like this. In the second verse of the whole letter, chapter 1, verse 2, they pray. And then in verse 3, they say that they should always be praying, thanking God uh, for these Thessalonians. And then at the end of chapter 1, still in the first chapter, they pray again. And then again, they pray at the end of chapter 2. 
And now in verse in verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul asks for prayer. And in verse 5, he's praying again. It's, it's as if Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy, the co-writers of this letter, it's, it's as if they think prayer is really important. Not to inform God or let God know what's actually going on. They don't pray like that. It's, it's not even to, to ask God to change his mind. They don't pray like that either. So chapter 3 seems to inform us that the way they pray shows that prayer is the act of depending on God to do what only God can do. Prayer is the act of depending on God to do what only God can do. So chapter 3 begins with a prayer request. And the request shows that these writers believe that only God can make anyone believe his gospel. They wrote this letter when fairly early in in Paul's 18-month stay in Corinth, things were not going well in his ministry. It's around the time when, when he was hitting a wall. He was hitting a wall of resistance. When the people in the synagogue were, were making him about as unwelcome as head lice. <laughs> How is Paul going to get through to them? How is Paul going to preach the gospel in such a way that they would listen? How, is, how, is Paul and, how are Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy going to make any impact on the city of Corinth as they were there as missionaries, as apostles of Jesus Christ? So just like Ezra and Babylon, Paul does the most practical thing he can do. He asks this, these Thessalonian believers to pray. To pray that God's word would do in Corinth exactly what God's word had already done in them, the believers in Thessalonica. And that's again what we see in verses 1 and 2. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. They say, pray for us. You see that in verse 1. And then actually what they're asking prayer for is not so much about them as that they would pray for the word of God. Because that's what they were trying to do. They, they were asking for prayer for their ministry, but that depended on the word of God doing something. So that's what they asked for prayer for. That the word of God will speed ahead. It's a funny expression that the word of God will speed ahead. The Greek word here means to race, to run, to be swift. Like the gospel of the Lord Jesus will somehow take a life, take on a life of its own. That, that it'll, it's like praying that the gospel would just take off, that it would explode in Corinth. And what would that look like for Paul? If that prayer was answered, and indeed the word of the Lord did speed ahead in Corinth like it had in Thessalonica, what would Paul expect to see? He tells us in verse 1, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, or be glorified, it could be translated. That the word of the Lord will be treated like the word of God that it is. That the word of the Lord would be so obeyed, and make such an impact among those who believe it and obey it, that it would be clearly seen that the word of the Lord is the word from God himself. To glorify the word of the Lord. So Paul says, pray for us, but, but actually pray for the word of the Lord, and pray that the word of the Lord is going to run swiftly, that it is going to take off in Corinth, and pray that when it does, people will honor it. They will honor honor the word of the Lord because it is the word of the living God. That's what we're praying. That's what we ask prayer for, Paul says. Just like it had happened in Thessalonica when those believers believed in Jesus Christ. And Paul uses words here when he says that the word of the Lord would, would uh, speed ahead. He uses words here that are taken from the imagery in Psalm 147. In verse 15, that psalm says, God sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. 
The psalm says that, that God's word runs swiftly and then goes on to say that it's God's word running swiftly that makes the snow fall and makes the frost fall and, and makes the winter come. And then it's still God's word that runs ahead swiftly in nature, in creation itself, that makes the spring come and makes the, 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 the ice and the snow begin to thaw and melt and makes the rivers run again. It's God's word that runs ahead swiftly and accomplishes whatever God wills. And just so nobody missed the point, in verse 19 of Psalm 147, it says, And he declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. The implication is that the people who hear God's word ought to believe God's word so that the word of God accomplishes what God wills. Is God's word honored in your life? Is God's word honored in my life? Is God's word honored in our lives like it is even in the weather? Does God's word accomplish his will in us? 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1 is a prayer request that God's word will accomplish God's sovereign will in saving lots of hearers in Corinth. It is God who sovereignly thaws the hearts of some of those who hear his word. It is God who sovereignly and graciously makes some of the hearers of his word believe the word that they hear. And it is God who can then make sure that evil men don't stop these men from preaching. When the people in the synagogue in Corinth, again, where Paul was writing this letter from, when the people in the synagogue began opposing Paul and reviling Paul, insulting him, Acts 18 uh, verse 6 says, Paul shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And that's exactly what Paul did, but he didn't have very far to go. He went literally right next door. And he began to preach there in a man's house, right next door to the synagogue. That's where Paul set up shop and began carrying on his ministry. And some of the Jews honored the word of the Lord that Paul preached, just as Paul asked for prayer here. Some of the Jews honored that word of the Lord. The ruler of the synagogue became a follower of Christ. Lots of Greeks believed and were baptized. But opposition was brewing. And so God gave Paul a vision at night. And the Lord said to Paul, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. I believe what God is saying to Paul there is, I have many in this people whom I have chosen, whom I have called, just like we read at the end of 2 Thessalonians 2. God is saying, I have many in this people who I have chosen to be saved through the gospel that you preach, so don't stop. Keep preaching. And Paul, I'm going to protect you. Evil will not stop you. Evil men will not prevent you from preaching the good news. Shortly after that, The Jews organized uh, an attack, uh, a mob against Paul, and they grabbed hold of him and they dragged him before the court in Corinth, before a judge named Gallio. And we know from history that Gallio was, was there as the judge in Corinth from about the year 51 to 52. It's one of the things we know from history outside the Bible. And they, they, the Jews tried to charge Paul with treason, but Gallio, Gallio wouldn't listen to them. He wouldn't even listen to their charges. He dismissed the case without hearing it and said that this is an internal matter about your religion. I'm not interested. And he dismissed them all and sent them away. And so in Acts 18 verse 18, it says, Paul stayed many days longer, preaching the word, teaching the gospel in Corinth. God's sovereign grace caused the gospel to spread in Corinth. God's sovereign grace caused the gospel to 
to be honored, cause the word of God to speed ahead, cause the word of God to have a harvest. God's sovereignty, his sovereign grace over Paul's ministry caused the plans of the Jewish people, the, the enemies of the gospel there, to be frustrated so that their schemes came to nothing. They were not able to stop Paul's ministry. Indeed, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy and their ministry was delivered from evil men. Verse 1 is a prayer request that God would do what only a sovereign and gracious God can do. And that's what happened. Because evangelism always depends on the sovereign grace of God. My second point is that without sovereign grace, you can't persevere in faith. We see this in verse 3. And the beginning of verse 3 is like a mirror uh, image to, to the end of verse 2. Look at it with me. The middle of verse 2 says, For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. And in the Greek language, uh, those words are really the same word for faith and faithful. It's, 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 it reads very obviously, so the contrast is striking. Not all trust God, but God is always trustworthy. Not all have faith, but God is always faithful. In verse 3, Paul counts on the faithfulness of God, the trustworthiness of God, the dependability of God, and says this is why he knows for sure that God will uphold the Thessalonians in their faith. Look at it again. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you, and he will guard you against the evil one. Because just like nobody, nobody can be evangelized or become a Christian apart from the sovereign grace of God. Nobody can keep believing. Nobody can keep on enduring in the faith, persevering in belief in Jesus Christ without the sovereign grace of God. God is the only one who can uphold you as a Christian. He is the only one who can deliver you from evil. This is why Jesus taught his followers to pray, to pray the Lord's Prayer in the same words in Matthew 6 verse 13, deliver you from evil. Jesus taught us, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why do we ask God for that? Unless we believe God can do it. The words in verse 3 are so similar to the words in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus commanded his followers to pray. He taught us to pray like this, with an absolute confidence in the sovereign grace of our Heavenly Father. Because it's a promise. God will, that's a future tense fact in verse 3, for followers of Jesus, God will establish you and guard you. God will protect you from evil. Your salvation, the effectiveness of the gospel preaching that you heard and believed, and the reason that you keep believing day after day after day, being upheld and protected, all of it depends on sovereign grace. On that rock-bottom Pivotal, real, ultimate reality that makes every eternal difference between those who are Christians and those who aren't. Verse 3 tells us what that ultimate reality is. That ultimate thing we must depend on, the bedrock of our salvation. Verse 3 says it in very clear terms. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. That is the ultimate fact behind why anyone is a Christian. God is faithful. Take the book of Acts, for example. 
the the book of Acts is the account of what the Jesus apostles, what his followers did right after the Lord ascended to heaven. How how the gospel began to spread, how the church began to grow. Acts two, uh, chapter two verse twenty three says Jesus' death was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Acts chapter three verse eighteen says what God foretold by the mouth of of all his prophets that this Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Acts 4.27 says all those responsible for killing Jesus, those who had, had risen up to, to arrest him, to try him, to kill him, that all those responsible for, for, the, for killing Jesus were doing whatever God's hand had predestined to take place. Acts also says that that's how people get saved. In Acts 2.39, it says, The promise is to everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And that said, just before 3,000 people became Christians and got saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 47 says, The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts chapter 13, verse 48 says, As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Even repentance and faith depend on God's sovereignty in Acts. Acts chapter 3 verse 16 says, faith is through Jesus. Acts 5.31 says, God exalted him to give repentance to Israel. To give repentance to Israel. Acts 11.18 says, to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Acts 16 verse 14 says, The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And Acts 18 verse 27 says, Those who through grace had believed. From the work of Jesus to the repentance and faith of those whom he saves, the book of Acts testifies that it all depends on God's sovereign grace. God's faithfulness, his trustworthy dependability is also the decisive cause behind your Christian obedience today and tomorrow and for the rest of your life. Verse 4 is also like the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 10, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 4 suggests that God's will will be done on earth in the Thessalonians. My third point is that without sovereign grace, you can't obey God's word. Look at verse 4 with me. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. This is the definition of well-placed confidence. We have confidence, Paul says, in the Lord. That's where our confidence rests. About you, dear Thessalonians. That's where my confidence rests about you, Christians in Beacon Church in Victoria. This is where my confidence rests in any Christian. It doesn't rest in the Christian. It rests in the Lord who is faithful. My confidence about your Christianity rests not in you, but in God. That's what Paul's saying in verse 4. There are so many brides who've heard their husbands to be promise, I do. Only to find out later that their confidence was not well placed. But here in verse 4, Paul says, and Silvanus and Timothy with him, that they are absolutely sure, they are 100% confident that the Thessalonians will keep on obeying God's word, that their commandments, the commandments of the apostles of Jesus Christ, which we have recorded in the documents of the New Testament, that these Thessalonians will keep on obeying what they taught them, what they commanded them to, to, to do, that they'll keep on doing it. But unlike a bride destined to be disappointed by an undependable husband, these missionaries, Paul and, and his, his fellow missionaries, are 100% confident that the Thessalonian believers will keep on obeying God's word because they know one thing. Because these missionaries know one thing. They know that the Christian, 
a Christian's obedience does not depend on Christians, but on Christ. Just as faith that perseveres in verse 3 depends on the fact that the Lord is faithful in verse 3. So too, Paul writes in verse 4, that the reason they are confident these Christians in Thessalonica would keep on obeying God, would keep on listening and doing what the Bible says, is that they are doing now and will do for the rest of their lives what God's word commands. The reason is because their confidence is in the Lord, says verse 4. Not in the Thessalonian believers themselves, in the Lord. Christian obedience. Christian obedience is not about obeying God's law perfectly. Only Jesus ever did that. Your continuing obedience today and tomorrow, your continuing obedience as a follower of Christ, as someone who keeps following Christ, as a believer in Christ, as someone who keeps believing Christ, as an obeyer of God, as someone who keeps obeying God today and tomorrow and the next day and the day after that when it's hard and the day after that when you're persecuted and the day after that when you suffer, your continuing Christian obedience does not ultimately depend on you. It depends on God being faithful. It is because of him that you repent when you sin. It is because of him that you stand up again when you fall. And when you fall again, you repent again. Why? Because of him. It is because of the sovereign grace of God in Christ Jesus that any of us keep on obeying, keep on submitting to the authority of Scripture. John said something similar in one of my favorite passages in 1 John chapter 1. John says this, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, to know him. This is how we know that we know him. If we obey, if we keep his commandments. Our obedience depends on him. Knowing him is the power to keep obeying him. When we start obeying and keeping the commandments of Christ, John says, we know that we've come to know Jesus because it's Jesus who causes us to persevere in faith. It's Jesus whose word brings about our continuing obedience. It's Jesus who whose faithfulness is the reason that Paul was so confident that God's will in heaven would be done also on earth in the lives of the Thessalonians, that he says in verse 4, we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. In verse 1, we saw that evangelism, the sharing of the gospel, the spread of the good work, good news, the, the, the gospel that makes you a believer, as well as every time you share the gospel with someone else, that it all depends on the sovereign grace of God. In verse 3, we saw that your perseverance, that you are established, that you will be protected and guarded against the evil one. We saw in verse 3 that your perseverance depends on the sovereign grace of God. And in verse 4, we've seen that your obedience, that you will keep on doing, what you've been commanded to do in the New Testament by the apostles of, the, of Jesus Christ, your obedience in the Christian life depends utterly again on the sovereign grace of God. There is no part of the Christian life that doesn't utterly depend on the sovereign grace of God through Jesus Christ. You can't be a Christian, not a real Christian, for even a single day without relying and depending utterly on God's powerful, steadfast love. Finally, to be a Christian, you need to depend on sovereign grace. Do you believe that God is honest? Look at verse 5 and read it with me. 
May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Paul has just done what Ezra did when Ezra boasted to the king of Babylon how great and powerful and gracious God is to those who seek him. Paul has just put God's reputation on the line. In verse 5, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Do you believe that God is honest? Do you believe God can be trusted? Do you believe that Jesus is who he said he is? Do you believe that the Lord is not a liar, but that he keeps his word? In other words, Paul's prayer in verse 5 shows us that to be a Christian at all, you need from the bottom of your heart to rely absolutely on God's love and the dependability, the steadfastness of Jesus Christ. Every part of being a Christian, from the beginning to the end, from conversion to the second coming, depends on this. Do you see how the Apostle's prayer in verse 1 comes down to his readers wanting and longing for God's word to be honored more? How their being established and delivered from evil in verse 3 depends on believing that the Lord is faithful, that he can be trusted, that you can believe in him. Do you see how even their obedience to what the apostles command, the, the, the obedience that ultimately depends on that same faithfulness, it depends on the faithfulness of the Lord. In verse 4, your whole life as a Christian, not in name only, not a nominal Christian, but a real genuine follower of Jesus Christ, relies always on one single fact, what you believe about God. Believing that he is steadfast. Your continuing life as a Christian relies every day on depending on the fact that God is loving. And on you believing that God is loving. Your Christian life from the first day of your, of your new life as when you're born again and converted by the gospel. From that first day until the day that you die or you're translated to glory at the second coming of Christ. Every day of your Christian life depends on Jesus Christ being steadfast and on you believing that he is steadfast. So ask yourself this. Is the love of God and the steadfastness of Jesus what keeps you going as a Christian? Paul prays, May the Lord Direct your hearts to this. The love of God and the steadfastness of Jesus. When Paul says, may the Lord direct your hearts, may he direct your hearts, he uses exactly the same word that the father of John the Baptist prayed when he said, because of God's mercy, the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those in darkness and to direct our feet in the way of peace. That's Luke 177, my translation. In the previous letter to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11, Paul prayed that God would direct our way back to you so that we could see you again. Now he prays, may God direct your hearts. To always see the love of God. To always see the steadfastness of Jesus Christ. To always reach out and grab hold and depend on the love of God. To always reach out and cling to the fact that Jesus is steadfast, dependable, trustworthy. What he says, he will do it. That that's the reason you hope. That that's the reason you believe. That God so loved the world that he sent his steadfast son. To be your Lord and Savior. So your salvation, it does not depend on you. It depends on him. Your perseverance in the faith does not depend on you, my friend. You're not that powerful. It depends on him. Your obedience does not depend on your willpower, does not depend on the strength of your conviction. 
It depends not on how much you believe the Bible. It depends on what you think about God. Your obedience depends on Him. It doesn't depend on you. You couldn't be a Christian for even a single day without utterly depending on God's sovereign grace. But once he shows you his love, the love of God, and once he proves to you the steadfastness of Jesus Christ, you can't help but rely on that. You can't help but depend on God to be whom God has showed himself to be. Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians is my prayer for you. That God will make sure that your heart is set on him like this every day of the rest of your life. And that's what it takes to live as a Christian. As we sang in the song that Kevin uh, led us in, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. May the Lord direct your hearts to himself today. Let's pray. Father, we ask, as needy children, weak, powerless, helpless. We ask because we are confident in your love and we are confident in the faithfulness of the Lord. We are confident in the steadfastness of Jesus Christ. And so we ask in his name, would you meet us in our moment of need? Oh, Father, would you give us the faith to believe in Jesus Christ? Some of us this morning or watching this video, some of us have never believed in Jesus Christ before. We've never asked you to save our souls. We've never confessed our sin to you and asked that you would forgive us our sin. Lord, but this morning we ask because of Jesus Christ, and we ask because of your love, and we ask that you would save us. And Lord, some of us have been struggling with enduring, with persevering, with continuing to live as Christians day after day after day. And we're afraid of the evil. We're afraid of the sin inside us that could lead us astray. We're afraid of the persecution that could rise up against us for the sake of following Jesus Christ. And we ask, because of your love, Heavenly Father, and because of the steadfastness of our Savior, we ask that you would hold us and keep us, that you would uphold us during upheaval. And Lord, Some of us struggle with obedience. All of us struggle with obedience. We all struggle with not just having the the, the courage to sit down and read the Bible, not just with the the, having the patience to sit and listen to a preacher, not just with the having the motivation to open the scriptures and even to, to see what it says. But we struggle so much to do what it says. We struggle to obey your word. And so we ask, Father, because of your love and because of the steadfastness of Jesus Christ, Father, that you would cause your word to run speedily ahead in our lives, to run swiftly, to accomplish what you will in us, that your will will be done in, on earth in our lives as it is in heaven. And we ask, O Lord, that every day, you would cause us to keep believing, to be, keep depending on your sovereign grace because of who you are, that we would see and become absolutely convinced of your love, and we would see and rely every day on the utter dependability, the steadfastness of Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.